Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The word of God that we focus on for this morning is found in the second reading from Romans chapter 13. Listen again to verse 11. And do this since you understand the present time. It is already the hour for you to wake up from sleep because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. This is God's word. Dear friends, in Christ Jesus, our coming King, a significant amount of the population suffers from a sleeping disorder known as somnambulism. Can't even say it very well. But at any rate, the study determined that there was about a third of children from ages 2 to 13 that deal with this. Not as many adults deal with it. It's it's estimated that maybe up to about 4% of adults deal with this. So what is somnambulism? Sleepwalking. You know it as sleepwalking. That's what it is simply. That's just the technical term. And sometimes we might kind of joke about sleepwalking, and sometimes it perhaps can be a little funny, but it can also be somewhat dangerous for the sleepwalker as they're walking about really unaware of their circumstances and surroundings and and oftentimes can hurt themselves in so doing. So how much of the world is sleepwalking? I think we'd have to say that a significant portion of it, right? The the majority of the world is sleepwalking in terms of God. They're sleeping on Christ. They're sleeping on his return. But you know, these words from Paul aren't being addressed to unbelievers. They're not being addressed to people who don't know anything about Christ and his impending return. Instead, Paul is talking to fellow believers. He's talking to Christians like you and me, to people who have already been awakened from spiritual slumber and who have seen the light of Christ. People who have come out of the darkness of sin and into the light of Christ when he clothed us through holy baptism. At one time we were asleep, secure in our sins, and now we are awake and called to live in the light of Christ and his will. But we need reminders of that, don't we? We need the Advent call to wake up. It serves as an encouragement to us. It serves as a warning to us. We need to hear it because we still are sinners, sinners who can and do fall. And so we need to begin this Advent season with the proper encouragement to wake up. We certainly are living in the night of this world. Think about what we mean by that. Not only are we surrounded by people who don't know Christ, but we're surrounded by people who oftentimes actively oppose Christ. We're surrounded by a a world that, that wants nothing to do with the will of God. What causes a person to walk into a nightclub or into a Walmart and just start shooting away? What causes a sovereign nation to embark on war with another sovereign nation just because they want to take it over? What causes people to harm their bodies with the illegal substances? The reality is that we are living in the night of this world, the night that is ruled by sin and death. The prince of this world has a firm grip on those who are living in spiritual darkness. The good news is that the fact of the matter is that the night is almost over. 
And we want to live every day of our lives with that fact in mind. After all, it's easy to be lulled to sleep by the ways of the world. It's easy to be lulled to sleep into thinking that we have plenty of time. The younger we are, maybe the more tempted we are to do that. But even as we're older and things seem to be go reasonably well, we're being lulled to sleep too. Darkness has a way of covering up the truth. The truth is that one way or another, our time here on earth will come to, de- to an end and could happen at any time. The end signals, the end of night signals something else. It signals that the day is almost here. We're talking about the day of Christ's return. And certainly that's good news for Christians, isn't it? But the fact that Christ is coming soon should impact us all the time. While we're living in the night, how often does the night affect us? It's very alluring. After all, we are sinners Sinners who are attracted to the darkness of sin oftentimes because the darkness of sin has often wrapped itself in an attractive way that's alluring to the eye. And Paul outlines three different pairs of activities that are often attractive in certain ways that we need to avoid. Carousing and drunkenness, sexual sin and wild living, strife and jealousy. Think about how all those things are kind of connected. One leads to the other, which leads to the other, right? God gives us many blessings to enjoy, but he doesn't want us to abuse those blessings either, right? He doesn't want us to overindulge in them. Overindulgence feeds the sinful nature And overindulgence also then leads to us thinking, well, we can kind of do whatever we want then, right? What does it matter who I sleep with? A one-night stand? That's no big deal. And then what happens? Households are divided. Relationships are destroyed. Marriages are ruined. Is any one of us immune from from sin, from any of this kind of thinking. Don't forget about Paul's warning to the Corinthians. So let him who thinks he stands be careful that he does not fall. The key is don't underestimate the power of your sinful nature. You can, and you certainly do fall. And maybe You don't have a tendency to fall into the temptations that Paul is talking about here in this text, in these words. But be warned that the allure of night is lurking out there and is trying to wrap itself in many different ways. Always trying to get you to fall. And sometimes you do. Sometimes you fall hard. And when that happens, the key is not simply to ignore it. The key is not to think of it as it's no big deal. The key is to let the light expose it for what it is. It's sin that damages our relationship with Christ and perhaps others too. As you have it exposed by the light of God's word, don't deny it or or try to defend it, but confess it. Confess how deeply you have hurt God and how deeply you have hurt others with what you've done and how you've even damaged your own heart and soul. Then that the light that exposed your sin also enlighten you with God's promises. Through Jesus, your sins are wiped away. Jesus never gave in to the allure of the night of sin. Jesus instead allowed himself to be swallowed up into death so that we would never be swallowed up 
into hell by our sins. The fact that Jesus lives again proves to us that our sins are indeed forgiven. As the day approaches when Christ our King comes, may this be our approach on life. Live in daily contrition and repentance. Daily turn away from your sin and receive the forgiveness that Jesus has for you. And then go on in the peace of Jesus, living a life for Jesus. And as you do, think of what's happening. You are following Paul's instructions here. Let us put away the deeds of darkness and put on the weapons of light. Weapons of light is oftentimes translated as armor of light. And in connection with what follows, it, it kind of makes sense that way too because Jesus, or Paul is using a picture of clothing, taking off certain clothing, putting on others. He tells us to take off those dirty clothes of yours, those deeds of darkness. We aren't to spend our days and nights into thinking how that we can indulge ourselves, how we can make our greedy or, or lustful or selfish hearts happy. But rather, we are to put on different clothes. We are to put on Jesus' clothes. Remember that when Christ first made you his child, that's exactly what he did. He took your filthy clothes off, washed them all away, and then made you clean, restoring you in righteousness. And now you are encouraged to do that daily. And in fact, he equips you with battle since he knows the enemies that oppose you. He tells you to put on the armor of light. And you'll need every bit of it. You'll need it because you can't rely on yourself. You need to rely on God and his protection. You need to rely on Christ and his word. Only with God can you defend yourself against Satan, the world, and your own self-accusing self. All of this will finally prepare you for when the day does arrive, either when you die or when Christ our King returns. And Paul reminds us our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. That's true every passing moment, isn't it? And again, that's a good thing. After all, it means that our final salvation is coming. The time when we will no longer be living in the night of this sinful world. The time when Satan will no longer be able to tempt us, the time when we will no longer struggle with ourselves. Yes, the time is coming when we will be delivered to the daytime where none of those things will ever exist. And that time is closer than we think. So be encouraged. Wake up. And stay awake. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.